thing. Which is the universe. <laughs>
early universe had low entropy. The fact that you can cause things, you can make a choice right now to do something tomorrow, but you can't make a choice to have done something yesterday, you can't. <laughs> that's because, the reason you believe that that's how the universe works is because entropy is increasing. Uh, cause and effect, the flow of time, it's all because we live in a universe that is nowhere near as disorderly as it could be. It's highly structured and it's growing more and more disorderly. So this begs a question. No, it does not. It raises a question. I can hate that. Sorry. <laughs> Why was the entropy of the universe so low to begin with? We understand that that's the important fact. We don't know what the explanation is. I don't know the explanation. You don't know the explanation. Don't believe anyone who knows. We are thinking about this, we professional cosmologists are trying very hard, having conferences, putting in grant proposals, trying to understand why the early universe was so orderly arranged. But we have ideas, we always have ideas, those are kind of cheap, so. Uh, this is an idea that goes back to the 1870s. Ludwig Boltzmann, who was a physicist from the 1870s, lived the physicist dream because on his tombstone there's an equation. <laughs> I always tell my students, what is the equation that will be on your tombstone someday? Both of equations, the definition of entropy, and because he defined what entropy means, what he realizes is that sometimes it will go down. It's true there's a law of physics that says entropy goes up, but that's only because it is overwhelmingly probable that the entropy will go up. Sometimes the air in this room will, just by the random motions of molecules, all collect in one little corner of the side of the room. If we lived in a universe that was all spread out and high entropy and disorganized, occasionally there would be times when it would just randomly fluctuate into a low entropy organized configuration, and then it would just fluctuate back, if you waited long enough. So if you wait, I mean, we're talking much, much longer than the age of the universe. But if the universe lasts forever, this will eventually happen. And Boltzmann said, well, maybe that's why our early universe was so orderly. Maybe our universe is just one of those things that happens from time to time. If you wait long enough, you're in this messy configuration of stuff, but there will be little regions that fluctuate into orderly configurations. Maybe that's where we find ourselves. <laughs> Maybe the whole universe is just an accident. Because things like this, you know, if you want to know why is the world like this, well, it just happens. <laughs> no, but this is not going to work, sadly. I want to emphasize, this was an idea in the 1870s. It's not right. We know better than this now. <laughs> so, it doesn't work. Why do we know it doesn't work? Because if it were true that most of the time the universe was disorganized and messy and high entropy, there would be fluctuations in the little orderly things, but almost all the time those would be small fluctuations. Minor decreases in entropy. You might fluctuate a person or a planet or one galaxy. There's no way you're going to fluctuate a hundred billion galaxies. There's no need for that. And if you think about it, you don't even need your body. You don't even need the whole person. I mean, it's nice. But really, to be a conscious being, you just need the brain that sort of fluctuates into existence out of the surrounding chaos long enough to look around and go, ha, ah, thermal equilibrium, chaos, and then fluctuate back. <laughs> If Boltzmann's scenario had been right, the overwhelming majority of people in the universe would be disembodied brains floating in the surrounding chaos. These are known as Boltzmann brains. We are not Boltzmann brains. We look around, look, other people. So Boltzmann could not have been right. Keep that in mind. But that was the 1870s. Surely we know more now than Boltzmann did in the uh, 1870s, and it's true. Not only do we know there was something called the Big Bang, but since 1998, we know the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating. It's expanding faster and faster. And the reason why, we think, is because of something called dark energy. This is a false colored image of a photograph of dark energy. <laughs> it's just, in every little point in the, in the universe, there's energy there, even in empty space. And this energy is pushing the universe apart, causing it to accelerate. And this is a tremendous Nobel Prize winning discovery. It hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet, but I will lay very, very long odds that it will. And it has consequences for how we think about the universe. The first one is the universe will not recollapse. It's not only expanding, but it's expanding faster and faster. It will last infinitely long into the future. The second one is that for all intents and purposes, it's finite in space. 
there's a region past which we can't see because the expanding universe is pushing it away from us. So for all intents and purposes, there's a finite size to the universe. And finally, Stephen Hawking, back in the 1970s, showed us that if you have dark energy, even empty space gives off radiation. Even empty space has a temperature. Empty space isn't completely empty. So what our discovery from 1998 tells us is that we have an eternal universe that is finite in size and has thermal fluctuations in it. In other words, exactly what Boltzmann imagined in the 1870s. But that's bad, because we don't live in a universe like that. It's told you that that can't be the right answer. <laughs> the universe is exactly like an eternal box of gas. This makes predictions. Those predictions are false. We don't know the way out of this dilemma right now. This is something we are trying to think about. Let me try to drive it home a little bit. This is how we usually draw the history of the universe, from the Big Bang, hot and dense, cools off, stars and galaxies, here we are today. Right? But that's a very parochial point of view. That's like, you know, the, the, the cartoon of Manhattan's view of the world, where it's just all, you know, Manhattan, a little bit of New Jersey, and everything else is squeezed in. But a better view would be to say that the universe is going to keep going, and the stars that light up our sky are going to die, and they're going to fall into black holes, and the universe will be nothing but black holes for a Google year. <laughs> the good old Google before the search engine came along. <laughs> it was a big number, 10 to the 100, a 1 followed by 100 zeros. That many years will be nothing in the universe but black holes. But that won't last forever. The universe lasts forever, but the black holes don't. The black holes evaporate, another Stephen Hawking discovery. So the black holes are going to go away. And then we will have nothing for 10 to the 10 to the 120 years. You can ask me afterward how I know that number, but it's a big number. You don't need to worry about the details. <laughs> and there's nothing there but empty space, but these empty spaces not completely empty. It fluctuates a little bit. There can be people in that empty space. You can count. You can predict how many people live there. It is overwhelmingly larger than the number of people who could possibly live here. The question is, why don't we live here in empty space? Why aren't we random fluctuations out of nothingness? And it's not because that would be sad. <laughs> it would be sad. It would be a better explanation than this. So I will, just, I will close with two things. First, I will just give you a, a guess. My favorite guess as to why we don't live there is because we do have random fluctuations, but they don't just create people, they also create universes. Einstein told us in the early 20th century that space and time are flexible, so you can imagine that space itself fluctuates and makes a little bubble of universe that is actually easier to make than a brain, or a person, or a galaxy. Easier to make a whole universe, because you can start them small and then they will grow, according to Einstein's laws of physics. So maybe that is where we are. Maybe the reason why our past was so orderly and tiny is because it came out of a random fluctuation. Now, if this happens, of course, it means we're not unique. It means that this happens all the time. And things like our universe are just one of those things that happens from time to time. And we're part of a multiverse with an infinite number of other universes. And I uh, talked about this once uh, on a show you might have heard of called The Colbert Report. <laughs> and Stephen Colbert says, so you mean that there's another universe out there where my show's at 11 o'clock and John Stewart's at 11 30? <laughs> what this kind of thing implies. So the final thing I want to say is that this is my favorite idea, but you shouldn't believe me. Not because I'm probably not right, but because we should be skeptical. But it's important. We don't know these things. We're speculating. We don't know how to connect these to data, to observations. And I got a, a letter, a good old-fashioned letter in the mail. This is something that we used to have, the right stamps. And uh, this was a letter from a 10-year-old boy, George Wing who read about these kind of crazy ideas in the New York Times, and he got very upset. So he wrote us a letter, and I have to read it to you because he was so upset his handwriting was not very good. So George says, I don't know if you exist, but I do. I do not agree with your article, and I do not believe that mumbo jumbo. If you do, well, it's a disturbing thought, but I know how to deal with it. I will not let the world disappear under my nose, but if you do, I can't say I'm sorry. <laughs> Sincerely, a ten-year-old who knows
was a little more than some people. <laughs> Yes, some people have a little too much time. <laughs>